It gives me real great pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to this very important lecture. This lecture serves to, and uh, that is what the, was the objective of the Council, to seek to stimulate constructive debate. We have two very distinguished lecturers, Professor Dr. Hochers and Professor Dr. Rohirs. A special word of welcome to you both, and we are so happy to hear what you have to say about stable government and our electoral system and other electoral systems that you might want to bring forward. We are really um, pleased that you are here and uh, we expect a very fruitful, healthy debate after your lecture, after what you have to share with us. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome one more, once more. We are very happy that you have taken time out to be here and to hear what these two distinguished lecturers, these two professors, uh, have to share with us. It is obviously a system that strongly favors large, huge, important and popular political formations and disadvantages smaller political groups. The big advantage of it is that it usually leads to a two or maybe three party system, which is a, a very successful key in forming stable governments. Because you usually have a one party government that has a clear majority in parliament. The big disadvantage of it, obviously, is that it very strongly misrepresents the actual political convictions among the people. And the recent British referendum shows how big that disadvantage can get. The two big political parties were both essentially for uh, letting Great Britain remain in the European Union, and yet the majority of voters voted against, because they couldn't, so to speak, canalize that feeling through the existing political parties in Parliament. Second example, France, our neighboring country in the north. That's very strange for me to say as a Dutchman that France is our neighboring country to the north, and yet <laughs> here it's true. Um, the lower house of the French Parliament, the Assemblée Nationale, the National Assembly, consists of 577 directly elected members. Each of them is elected, is chosen in a single seat constituency, exactly like in uh, the United Kingdom. But there is one big difference. Uh, the French do not use a first-past-the-post system, but have a different system of selecting the members of uh, the House of, uh, sorry, of the, the, the National Assembly. Um, the only way in which a candidate is directly elected into Parliament in France is if he or she uh, succeeds in getting not only an absolute majority, so more than 50% of the votes cast in the election in that constituency, but also if that 50% plus one majority also contains at least one quarter of the votes of the uh, registered voters in that constituency. So there is, there is so, to, so to say, a double hurdle. More than 50% of the votes cast, and this more than 50% must be at least 25% of the registered voters in that constituency. So when only a very few people turn out for the votes, you have a problem, even if you get more than 50% of the vote. This is the reason why it is extremely rare in France that during the first round of elections, people are already chosen into, elected into parliament. If none of the candidates succeeds in passing this double hurdle, a second round is held two weeks later. This second round is held between all the candidates that have obtained at least 12.5% of the valid votes of the registered voters in the constituency. Usually that's three candidates, sometimes four, and sometimes just two. But usually it, it turns out to be three. The candidate is elected that in the second round gets a relative majority of the votes cast. Um, because 
in France, two rounds have to be held. And in between, wheeling and dealing between political parties are usually necessary to make it sure for a candidate to be able to elect in the second round. This system less strongly favorizes large political formations than in England. It leads to a situation where smaller political parties can be influential because their support might be necessary in the second round for a candidate of a party to pass that hurdle in the second round. What somewhat surprised me when I researched uh, for this lecture is that France is momentarily actually the only country in the world that uses this system for parliamentary elections. It is rather common in countries that elect their president. It's used in France for the presidential elections as well. But that is nothing special. That they use it for parliamentary elections is somewhat special. They're the only country in the world to do that. Although a system somewhat comparable to this used to exist in Germany between 1871 and 1918 under the German uh, Reich in, in the empire. And, oh yes, it existed in the Netherlands as well. Before we introduced pure proportional representation in 1917, we followed a, a variant of this system. Which brings me to the third example of how you might elect a parliament, namely Germany. I am a professor of constitutional law in Germany and it always pleasures me greatly to explain the Dutch electoral system to the Germans. It amazes them how simple elections can be made, actually. <laughs> On the other hand, I have to explain to my Dutch students how the Germans do it. And I'm going to try to explain it to you as well. Bear with me, they're Germans. <laughs> All right. Now, the Federal Republic of Germany has a directly elected Chamber of Parliament called the Federal Diet, the Bundestag. This federal diet nominally exists of 689 members. Exactly half of them, 299, are elected in single seat constituencies. And they are elected if they gain a relative majority of the votes cast. This is the British system. You follow it up till here, right? Okay. The other half, also 299 votes in the federal diet, are elected from a uh, party list in which candidates are nominated or are enlisted in a fixed order. And each German has two votes. His first, his or her first vote is on the candidate in the constituency. And his second vote is on the party list. And here comes the trick. Everyone in Germany, every candidate for parliament, has to be both a candidate in his or her constituency and on the party list. This is obligatory. You are a candidate on both. Which means that many people are chosen twice. They are chosen in the constituency and they are chosen on the party list. If that happens, and it happens a lot, then the German electoral code says, okay, candidates who are both chosen in a constituency and on a party list lose their party list seat. They only get their constituency seat. They are directly elected on the basis of the first vote, the erste Stimme, as it is called in German, the erste Stimme. Only those candidates that did not obtain a, lease, uh, a seat through the constituency are elected into parliament on the party list if they are elected via the party list. That means that from the larger German political parties, usually the members of parliament are elected through the constituencies, because obviously for a bigger party it's easier to obtain a relative majority of votes in the constituency than for a smaller party, whereas for the smaller German parties, their members of parliament are usually elected through the party list, because usually they don't win a constituency. Now, and if you follow me in uh, a short example, suppose party A, which is a big party, gains 250 constituencies of the 299. Suppose this is true. That party also gains 253 seats on the party list. What happens? The first 250 people elected on the party list lose their party list seat because they are already elected in the constituency. And only the three members that were not elected in the constituency get a seat based on the party list. 
So how many seats does this party get? 253, which is the number of seats that was obtained through the party list. You see how this works? The number of seats is in Germany usually fixed through the party list, through the second vote, through proportional representation. But the people elected into parliament, in large part, are, di are di elected in constituencies, leading to a system of, you know, uh, confidence and locality between the member of parliament and, uh, um, and their, 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 his or her voters, which is exactly the reason the Germans chose this system. It is a brilliant system, but it's extremely complicated and no one else does this. <laughs> but it is rather well thought of, although I'm absolutely sure that most Germans have no idea what they're doing when they're voting. <laughs> when you go to, to the ballot in Germany, they have this, this small schemes hanging on the wall explaining what happens with this one arrow first vo vote and then the second arrow second vote going into the ballot box to explain to voters what they're actually doing there. Um, so, uh, the German system has, tries to combine the advantages of a system of constituencies, namely a direct relationship between the electorate and the elected, and the advantages of proportional representation, namely a more fair result. And this also leads in Germany to some political fragmentation, although they try to compensate for this through a rather big electoral hurdle, you have to get at least 5% of the second vote or three direct constituencies through the first vote to get into parliament in the first place. If you pass either one of these hurdles, you get all the votes, all the seats you are entitled to. So, concludingly, there is indeed some relationship between, on the one hand, uh, electoral system systems, and on the other hand, the forming of stable governments. There is, there is some relationship between these two. Um, and it looks prima facie that St. Martin has a system that leads to political instability. But you have to take into account that effectively the St. Martin electoral hurdle is almost 7%, which is almost 2% higher effectively than that in Germany. And it is in fact one of the highest electoral hurdles in the world because parliament is so small. So, if you take that into account, it's rather strange to say that there should be a relationship between the system of elections and the stability of government. If you take that into account, it might not come as a surprise that the relationship between these two is not so very big, actually. The big problem that St. Martin faces, the ship jumping of politicians, hasn't necessarily that much to do with the way in which they are elected. Um, in fact, suppose St. Martin were to introduce, let's say, a variety of the British or the French system, a system with single-seat constituencies, such a situation might even make things worse, because then members of parliament would, could at least arguably claim that they have a direct personal electorate, <laughs> representatives from, from some part of St. Martin, I am the member for Dutch cul-de-sac, just for example, so I am personally entitled to, to decide how I am going to represent the interests of my voters. It's, it's not really that clear that introducing another form of, um, uh, of elections might solve the St. Martin problems of ship jumping and going in alone of members of parliament leading to instability of government. Recently, it has been claimed, and it's a far from new idea, it has not only been claimed in St. Martin, but in many other countries as well, that in fact, if uh, people are chosen to parliament, because they are chosen on a party list, well, the seat they have belongs to the party. So if they leave that party, well, then they should give up their seat. Basically, all political parties in the Western world, I've been uh, told and I understood from uh, the letter that uh, you wrote in the Daily Herald this morning that this is the same here for most political parties as mine as well. They let their uh, candidates for parliament swear solemn oath signed in blood under a full moon that they will give up their seat if they disagree with their party and leave their party. All Dutch political parties do the same. And all German political parties, all British and what have you. And every political party knows that this is ex again, bullshit. <laughs> Legally speaking. There is no way of enforcing it. 
I mean, it looks nice on paper, but it has no legal meaning at all. And why is that? Well, that is because in basically all Western democracies, seats are not party seats, but are personal seats of the members of parliament. Uh, it's the same uh, here in St. Martin as well. Um, under the St. Martin Electoral Code, votes are not cast on lists, let alone on parties, but on candidates placed on a list. This is made clear by Article 67 of the Electoral Code. Article 67 states that the voter casts a valid vote by making red a white dot in front of the name of the candidate of his or her choice. In front of the name of the candidate of his or her choice. That is the Dutch system. That is what we have done since 1917. Votes are cast upon a person. That person is on a list. That's true. But the vote is not cast on the list. The vote is cast on the person on the list. You don't make red a white dot before the name of the political party. You make red a white dot in front of the name of the candidate that you prefer. It's a great honor for me to be here tonight and to make some remarks on the uh, eloquent lecture uh, my friend Professor Hogers made. Um, you will see I'm not as eloquent as he, so I have to write my lecture for you. And to help you a little bit, I have made some PowerPoint um, presentation. First of all, we have to agree on what the problem is we want to solve. Professor Hogers says multiple elections for the Staten after 2010 and even more changing of governments without elections. Basically, all triggered by one cause, ship jumping and or going alone by parliamentarians. Governments find themselves confronted with sudden and unforeseen losses of parliamentary confidence. Well, you will, you will hear a lot, we agree on a lot of points on that. What are these solutions? Professor Hoges says, after having elaborated on electoral systems, he says, he concludes that reform of the electoral system of St. Martin would hardly be able to solve this problem. We have heard a lot of electoral systems. I would even say, it is not even capable of solving these problems at all. So, what is the real problem? I don't think the problem is the electoral, electoral system. The real problem is the way the Staten and the Parliament deal with each other. The problem lies in the checks and balances that are disturbed by the way politicians manifest themselves nowadays, I think. Electoral lists or political parties play a less and less important role in the recent decennia. Not only in St. Martin, but worldwide there is a tendency in politics that political individuals manifest themselves as strong leaders and are becoming themselves more important than the political parties and the programs and ideals they stand for. When I was a student in the 70s, of the last century, I read the programs of the political parties and compared them before I gave my vote to a party. I did not vote for the politician, I did vote for the party and the ideals the party stands for. Nowadays, political leaders debate on television and the smartest politician, the man or woman who has the most charisma, wins the election. Since the downfall of the Iron Wall in Europe and the decline of communism, ideological ideas are done and over with in politics. Politics are about persons, not about ideals anymore. To put it bluntly, you know. Political, people love political leaders like Bundeskanzler Merkel and President Obama more as a person than for the ideals they stand for. That makes it also possible, and to my regret, that politicians like Trump, Wilders, Marie Le Pen, and Berlusconi, and Putin can stand up and be supported. The consequences of this personalization, as I call it, the personalization of politics, are that politicians in the government and in parliament tend to go for their own position in power and 
preservation of that position rather than the care of the common interests, although they might tell us otherwise. <laughs> the goods once excluded, of course. In a small community like St. Martin, the urge to manifest oneself toward family and friends and business partners is even more tempting than in larger societies. That makes the system of checks and balances vulnerable to destabilization, like we have already seen in St. Martin since 101010. How to solve these problems? Professor Hoges offers us is four solutions. The rights of a politi political party to recall a seat when a representative leaves the fraction, the Suriname way, a constructive rule of confidence in the constitution that forces parliament to appoint a new prime minister when there is a breach of confidence between staten and government. Second solution. Thirdly, changing the rules of order in in order to limit the financial support of the members of the Staten who have left their fractions and changing the rules of order to make it impossible for individual members of the Staten to be a member of all committees of the Staten and limiting full speaking rights in Parliament. Professor Ogers elaborated on these points already. The government of St. Martin has also offered us a solution, he said so already. It made a legislative proposal to change Article 33, Paragraph 1 of the Constitution, saying that only a majority of the members of the Staten who are members of a political party may vote for a proposition to appoint new ministers. Although this proposal has not yet made public, in the press we already read that Minister Plastek doesn't agree with this proposal. I will more accurately look into these solutions in the following. But first of all, I'd like to emphasize that the statute of the Kingdom of the Netherlands gives no specific rules for the mutual relation between government and parliament. So St. Martha has a lot of freedom to reorganize this relationship. Well, the first solution, the Suriname way, I call it. I don't think that this is the right way under the present circumstances. Individual members of parliament have the right to have their own opinion on matters that are discussed in parliament, even when this does not match with the opinion of the party they are a member of. We don't have a parliament of political parties, but of individual members. Professor Hocus already said so. Members of parliament are individually responsible for what they do. The members shall not be bound by a mandate or instructions when casting their votes, as Article 61, Paragraph 3 of the Constitution say, says. Second solution, a constructive rule of confidence. A constructive rule of confidence, as mentioned by Professor Hogus, might be a solution once a breach of confidence between government and parliament has come up. But it is no solution to prevent such a breach to happen. I don't think it has any preventive effect upon members who want to go for their own glory. On the contrary, maybe even it seduces them to pass a vote of non-confidence if they think they can be the next prime minister. And then the measures that limit the possibilities of the individual members of parliament. I hope to have made clear already that I don't support measures that give more power to political parties, to fractions in parliament, at the cost of the individual responsibility of members of parliament. So, removing financial support for members of the state, Staten who have left their fractions or minimize their membership of committees or of full speaking rights are not, in my opinion, effective and rightful ways to force Parliament to function properly in the general interest of the country. And then the legislative proposal. I don't think the proposal change of the Constitution, Constitution is a good idea. I agree with the advice uh, of the Council of Advice that this proposal violates the equality rule and the rule of free mandate. It provides 
for two kinds of members in the Staten. Members who are loyal to their party and ship jumpers who have lesser rights. It also makes political parties more important than they should be, as I already said before. And Minister Plastic also points at the problem that it is not clear who decides whether someone is still a member of a political party or not. The Council, has, the Council of Advice also rightfully points at the possibility that a minority in the state passes a resolution on the appointment of a cabinet which violates the majority rule. Mr. Plastak thinks that this is not beneficial to the stability of the government. It puts the cabinet under a lot of pressure. I agree with all these objections, so the proposal is not a good idea if you ask me. What then are my solutions? A more radical solution would be to remove the obligation for a minister and the government to surrender office, Article 33. Paragraph 2 of the Constitution, and not, on the other hand, to remove the right of the government to dissolve the Staten, Article 59, Paragraph 1 of the Constitution. If you, both rules should be expunged in order to bring back the balance in power between the two. That's a quite radi radical solution, I know. Under these circumstances, the government and the Staten are convicted to do business with each other during the whole period they are established. The only power the state have left is the right of budget, Article 100 of the Constitution, that can make it impossible for the government to actually govern. These measures put more emphasis on the functioning of the state as a whole, instead of individual members or political fractions seeking individual glory by exercising their power. But for exceptional situations, one might consider a right for the state to send away the government, but only by a two-third majority of the votes of the sitting members. The rights of the government, on the, other, on the other hand, to dissolve parliament can be left out, being obsolete already, I think. I agree with Professor Hirsch Ballin, who wrote to Prime Minister Gums in October 2015, that this solution only can be used when a majority of the state finds this acceptable acceptable or wishes the cabinet to do so. But one might be wise to consider the possibility that dissolving the states is only possible also when two-thirds of the staten themselves agree to bring back the balance of power. <laughs>